Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 6 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled The Mystery of the Gospel. It's ready for teaching on August 5. The author is John McVeigh and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word helps explain to us the mystery of the gospel, and yet it still is a mystery that you could express your love so much that our gratefulness just could not encompass it. And we also thank you that there are just so many mysteries there that it can keep us involved in study for so long through our lives. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will bless us and guide us wherever we are listening. Whether we're listening in Invercargill in New Zealand or Wabag in Papua New Guinea or Toowoomba in Queensland... Or particularly I'd like to pray today for Pauline and Joel in Jamaica and Emma Hernandez in Texas and Claudio Fraxus Jr. and Karen Hetherington and Perla Caraveo, who is not well. Lord, I pray that your healing hand may be upon her, that you'll bless her and her family and Andronike Wells and Nonhalana Mbengji, uh, we just pray that you'll be with each of the members of the family and Joan Skinner in Jamaica and Manelli Zatina and her daughters and her husband and Joan Philip Gregory in Antigua and Velma Walker and Lord, for all the people who are listening today, may we come closer to you, may we more fully understand the mystery of the gospel. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is from Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations for ever and ever Amen. Let's read that again. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul opens with a theme that he had already touched on earlier, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. And though that might not be much of a surprise to the church today, composed mostly of Gentiles, it was something that seemed radically new to many of his readers at that time. Paul then continues his inspired words as the Apostle reflects on his passion to preach the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. We learn, too, of his current hardships in extending that ministry, hardships that include time in a Roman prison. And we also hear his commitment to the mystery at the heart of the gospel, the mystery that, in the church, Gentiles are on equal footing with their Jewish brothers and sisters. We experience his excitement for the church and its cosmic mission. We listen as he prays, praising God for expressing his grace through the church. In short, we are inspired to join Paul in his passion for the gospel. Sunday, July 30. Paul, imprisoned apostle to the Gentiles. Read Ephesians chapter 3. As you do so, identify one or two main themes. What major points does Paul make? 
Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3 displays an interesting structure. Paul begins the chapter with these words in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Then he breaks off for what turns out to be a lengthy digression focused on his work as apostle to the Gentiles in verses 2 to 13. After the aside, he signals a return to his original train of thought by repeating the phrase, for this reason, in verse 14, with verses 14 to 21 providing his interrupted prayer report. In Ephesians 3.1, Paul identifies himself as the prisoner of Christ Jesus, his way of arguing that Though he may reside in Roman captivity and appear to be under the authority of the Roman Empire, there is a deeper divine purpose being worked out in his life. He is not the prisoner of Rome, but the prisoner of Christ Jesus. And we go to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 on this very point. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Paul's mention of his suffering in verse 13 of chapter 3 and his later mention of his chains in chapter 6 verse 20 suggests that he is not under relatively comfortable house arrest. And we'll also check out Acts 28 verse 16, but he is in prison. Let's check Ephesians 6.20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And we're comparing that now with Acts 28.16. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Being in prison in the first century and in a Roman dungeon was especially challenging. The Roman Empire did not run well-organised prisons with sanitary facilities and regular meal service. 
In fact, the empire had little need for prisons since incarceration was not used as a means of punishment. People were placed in prison only while they awaited trial or execution. Prisoners were expected to provide for themselves and were dependent on relatives and friends to supply food and other needs. Paul's worries perhaps centred on the emotional impact of his imprisonment on believers, since being a prisoner was an extreme social disgrace in the context of an honour-shame culture. He might fear that some will say, How can Paul be the apostle and messenger of the exalted Christ and be a despised prisoner? So, he reframes his imprisonment, helping believers to see it as part of God's plan. He is suffering for them, suffering for you, it says in the ESV, and what appears to be a source of shame will in fact turn out to be for their glory. As we read in Ephesians 3 verse 13, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to trust God and His ways amid what can be very trying circumstances? Monday, July 31. The Long Hidden Mystery of the Gospel What is the mystery that has been entrusted to Paul? Well, we read this in Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 6. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the Gospel. As you study Ephesians 3, 1-6, note the following. First, Paul writes this part of the letter specifically to Gentile believers in the house churches of Ephesus. Let's read that again. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Second, Paul claims to be the recipient of something he labels, the stewardship of God's grace given to him for you, for the Gentile believers in verse 2. This stewardship, or this ministry of grace, is Paul's way of describing the commission given to him to preach the gospel, or God's grace, to the Gentiles, as we read in verses 7 and 8, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Third, Paul claims that a mystery has been revealed to him, a topic he has already written about in the letter, as we saw in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. The mystery of Christ. Let's read verses 3 and 4 again. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And he says he's written before, and that's in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. And he also wrote Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, 
that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Paul does not wish to be understood as the inventor of the gospel, but he does lay claim to a God-given ministry to proclaim it. Fourth, Paul is not alone in having received advanced revelation about this mystery, as the Spirit has also revealed it to Christ's holy apostles and prophets in a way that surpasses the revelation of God's plan to earlier generations, as we read in verse 5. Let's have a look at that again. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The term prophets here probably refers to those possessing and exercising the gift of prophecy among early Christian house churches, rather than the prophets of the Old Testament. The mystery, which was once hidden, has now become what we might call an open secret. Finally, he declares, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, in verse 6. Paul is passionate about the gospel and especially about the way it is expressed in the church, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. These two groups have become the building blocks of God's new community, his new brand of humanity. The church, as we see in Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. We could say, they are now transformed from being enemies to being co-heirs, co-bodied, included in a single body, the body of Christ, and co-partakers of the gospel promise as we see in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And so to finish today, what, if any, attitudes, maybe even below the surface, might you hold that contradict the inclusiveness taught by the gospel? How do you rid yourself of these? Tuesday, August 1. The Church, Revealer of God's Wisdom. What does Paul say about God and the actions of God in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 13? Of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power 
To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the Church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul again lays claim to being a minister through the gift of God's grace, as we read in verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. And Ephesians 3, 1 and 2, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, this gift, like the gospel itself, is not granted because of the worth of the recipient, but through God's grace. Paul underlines the point by describing himself as the very least of all the saints in verse 8. There is an interesting progression in Paul's self-understanding that is discernible as we move through Paul's letters in the order they were written. Early on, he lays claim to his status as a divinely appointed apostle in Galatians 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Later, though, he introduces himself as the least of the apostles and not worthy to be called an apostle in 1 Corinthians 15.9. Here in Ephesians, he sees himself as the very least of all the saints in chapter 3, verse 8. And that's a translation from the ESV. Finally, he describes himself as the chief or worst of sinners in 1 Timothy 1. 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Perhaps this line of thinking here by Paul can help explain this famous quote by Ellen G. White. It comes from Steps to Christ, page 64. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. End of quote. Paul then continues. In Ephesians 3.10 he writes, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Who are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places mentioned here? How does the church announce God's manifold or multifaceted wisdom to them? Though Ephesians 3.10 does not describe the nature of the powers, it seems best to take them as the evil ones described in more detail in Ephesians 6.11 and 12, which read, Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. If so, the composition of the church, unifying Jews and Gentiles as once very divided parts of humankind, becomes a ringing announcement to these demonic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places of God's plan for the future to unite all things in him, Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, as it says in verse 10. They are put on notice that God's plan is underway and their doom assured. The very nature of a unified church signals their ultimate defeat. And so to finish the day, 
If your own congregation took seriously Paul's job description of the church in Ephesians 3 verse 10, how might it change the way you and your fellow church members relate to each other? Let's finish by reading Ephesians 3.10 to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Wednesday, August 2. Christ dwelling in your heart. Compare Paul's earlier prayer request, Ephesians 1, 16-19, with his plea for believers in Ephesians 3, 14-19. In what ways are the two requests similar? Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 16, Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. And we're comparing that with Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 19. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Behind the English translations of Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 is an important play on words. When Paul says that he bows before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, he is exploring the phonetic connection between the Greek word for father, pater, and the Greek term for family, patria. In Ephesians, Paul celebrates the comprehensive nature of God's plan of salvation, which involves all things, as we read in uh, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, for all time, in verse 21 it said as well. And here he lays claim to every family in heaven and on earth as belonging to the Father. Every family, patria, takes its name from the Father, pata, This is very good news. Ponder this thought. Your family, despite its imperfections and failings, belongs to God. Your family is not in the cruel grip of fate, but in God's caring hands. God loves imperfect families. They bear the divine name. They carry the mark of his ownership. In Ephesians 3, 16-19, which we've just read, Paul asks God to grant believers an abundant spiritual experience marked by inner strength through the Spirit's presence, in verse 16, intimacy with Christ, who is also portrayed as dwelling within, in verse 17, and a settled, secure spiritual identity, rooted and grounded in love, in verse 17. As Paul seeks to offer praise to God for the expansive reach of blessings offered to believers, he includes not three dimensions, but four, breadth and length and height and depth in verse 18. He does not clearly identify to what these dimensions apply, though they obviously describe the vast size of something important. This leaves an interesting puzzle for Bible students. Do these dimensions describe God's wisdom, as we could read in Job 11, 
which uses four dimensions, God's power, as we would read in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, or perhaps the spiritual temple of Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. And we'll compare this with Ezekiel 43, 13 to 16, which uses four dimensions. And we've got references here to Amos and to Revelation. Let's go back to Job 11, verses 5 to 9. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you, that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence. Know, therefore, that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And Ephesians three sixteen and 17, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. And Ephesians two nineteen to 22, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Then we compare with Ezekiel 43, verses 13 to 16. These are the measurements of the altar in cubits. The cubit is one cubit and a hand breadth. The base one cubit high and one cubit wide, with a rim all around its edge of one span. This is the height of the altar. From the base of the ground to the lower ledge, two cubits. The width of the ledge, one cubit. From the smaller ledge to the larger ledge, four cubits. And the width of the ledge, one cubit. The altar hearth is four cubits high with four horns extending upward from the hearth. The altar hearth is twelve cubits long, twelve wide, square at its four corners. And then Amos 7, verses 7 and 8, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. And Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. It may be best to see these four dimensions as describing the immensity of the love of Christ, as we read in Ephesians 3.19, viewing the phrase to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of verse 18 as parallel to the next phrase, to know the love of Christ in verse 19. And we compare that with Romans 8.35-38. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. However we say his words, they are good news. Thursday, August 3. 
glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Paul concludes his prayer report with a doxology, a brief poetic statement of praise to God. For what does he praise God? Well, let's read Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations for ever and ever. Amen. Paul has been recording his prayers for believers and uh, we read in uh, Ephesians 3, uh, 14 to 19 this. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width, the length, and depth, and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now he prays directly and powerfully. Paul's doxology raises two questions. One, does the passage inappropriately elevate the church, placing it on a par with Christ in the phrase, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus in verse 21 of chapter 3? While Paul is highly interested in the church in Ephesians, it is clear that Christ is the saviour of the church, since it is Christ who dwells in the hearts of believers, as we read there in verse 17. In the doxology, Paul praises God for the salvation offered to the church through Christ Jesus. 2. Does the phrase, throughout all generations, for ever and ever, in verse 21, portray an unending, earthbound future for the church, with the return of Christ put on hold? Ephesians exhibits a robust expectation for the future. For example, Ephesians 4.30 looks toward the day of redemption. Also, believers will experience Christ's limitless sovereign power in the age to come, as you read in Ephesians 1.21. Paul's doxology should be read as a celebration of Christ's unending power exercised on behalf of the believers. Looking back over Paul's second prayer report in Ephesians 3.14-21, Compare Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. We see Paul finding strength in the cosmic scope of the Father's care, particularly in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Let's read those two passages. Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations for ever and ever. Amen. And we compare that with chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom 
and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only is in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And the ready availability of the Holy Spirit we read about in Ephesians 3.16, the partnership of Christ himself in verse 17, and the immeasurability of the limitless love of Christ in verses 18 and 19. This is so true that he imagines believers being filled with all the fullness of God in verse 19 and celebrates these spiritual realities in praise, again marvelling at the abundance of God's power on offer to the saints in verses 20 and 21. Whenever we feel the press of problems, temptations or doubts, we may turn to this buoyant account of Paul's prayers. The imprisoned apostle raises our vision to the grand horizon of God's purposes and grace reminding us that, whatever our current circumstances, we are participants in God's ultimate plan, as we read in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and His power is at work in us. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 reads, Having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. And so to finish the day, what blessings from God are especially valuable to you? Practice composing a prayer of praise in order to praise God for them. Friday, August 4. From the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of October 1, 1889, we read from an article by Ellen White. It reads, How can we harmonise our dwarfed spiritual condition with the presentation of our text in Ephesians 3, 14-19 that describes the fullness of knowledge it is our privilege to possess? How can heaven look upon us, who have had every spiritual and temporal advantage that we might grow in grace, when we have not improved our opportunities? The Apostle did not write these words to tantalise us, to deceive us, or to raise our expectations, only to have them disappointed in our experience. He wrote these words to show us what we may and must be if we would be heirs in the kingdom of God. How can we be labourers together with God if we have a dwarfed experience? We have a knowledge of the Christian's privilege and should seek for that deep spiritual understanding in the things of God that the Lord has desired us to have. Do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe that we may attain to the knowledge of God that is presented before us in this text? Do we believe every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? Do we believe the words that have been spoken by prophets and apostles, by Jesus Christ, who is the author of all light and blessing, and in whom dwelleth all richness and fullness? Do we really believe in God and in his Son? End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, Compare Paul's doxology in Ephesians three twenty and 21 to other doxologies in the New Testament. Well, let's read Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. 
Let's look at this one in Romans 11, 33-36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments, and His ways past finding out! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become His counsellor, or who has first given to Him, and it shall be repaid to Him? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. And then in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ for ever. Amen. And Philippians chapter 4 verse 20. Now to our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And Second Peter 3 verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and for ever. Amen. And Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and for ever. Amen. What themes or ideas move through these passages? How might we adopt the attitude of praise and worship they illustrate? And two, compare Paul's four uses of the Greek word pleroma, P-L-E-R-O-M-A, meaning fullness, in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 10 reads, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, and Ephesians 1.23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and Ephesians 3.19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God, and Ephesians 4.13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why do you think this idea is important to Paul? And question three, of all the actions of God that Paul praises in Ephesians 3, which is most inspiring to you, and why? And question four. Paul concludes the first half of Ephesians just as he began it. We, he started in chapter 1, verses 3 to 21, employing the language of prayer and praise. He exalts in God's power, present in the lives of the believers through Christ and the Spirit, as we read in chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. How can we, as Ellen G. White wrote above, better experience this power in our lives? And for today's Inside Story, here's Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Fighting with Scripture, Part 3, by Andrew McChesney That night, Elmira woke up after having another nightmare and she resolved to go to the Seventh-day Adventist church the next Sabbath. But in the morning she thought, I'm not a Christian, I can't go there. The following night she had another nightmare, and she struggled again over what to do. On Sabbath she went to the Adventist church. After several weeks, Almira's parents found out that she was attending the church every Sabbath, and they forbade her from going. Other relatives heard and implored her not to go. Neighbours saw her walking to the church on Sabbath and purposely came out of their apartment buildings to scold her. Going to church became a deeply unpleasant battle every Sabbath. But Elmira enjoyed worshipping at the church and she kept on going. She was learning about Jesus and finding peace in him. But at home, for evil presence persisted. The spirit kept coming at night. Elmira began to pray out loud 
In the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, protect me from Satan so I can sleep. She prayed the prayer every night for three months. The prayers dispelled the spirit, but she remained scared. She told the Adventist pastor about her fears, and he suggested that she also read the Bible out loud. Whenever she sensed the spirit, she opened her Bible to Isaiah 43. She especially liked the promise, But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. Since you are precious in my sight, you have been honoured, and I have loved you. Therefore I will give men for you, and people for your life. Isaiah 43, 1-4 she also found comfort in Isaiah forty nine twenty four to 25 which says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. New King James Version One night, she confessed all her sins out loud to Jesus. After that, she slept better than she had in a long time. Finally, Almira stopped being afraid. When she read the Bible and prayed, the spirits always left. She realized that even though the spirit was stronger than her, Jesus was stronger than both. We'll read more about Almira next week. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel in Russia and around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.